Can we get right to our talk of the tape today? That Fed decision and the fallout for the already fragile markets and your money. Let's ask those critical questions today to our special guest, Double Line CEO and Chief Investment Officer Jeffrey Gundlach. He is back with us now in a CNBC exclusive. Jeffrey, welcome back. It's nice to have you again. Yes, uh, Judge, this is turning into something of a habit doing the 4 p.m. Eastern Fed Day show. So I'm it, happy it, to be here. It, with it you certainly there. is. It is, and, I, and I'd like to keep that going. Uh, let me get first off your, your reaction to what happened today. I know from your tweet last night you wanted 200 basis points, and we both know that wasn't going to happen. But what do you make of the 75 that you got? Well, it's pretty obvious that was going to happen. As you've been saying since Monday, Judge, I mean, that was obviously it didn't just fall out of the sky. It was pretty obvious they were going to do 75, and they were, they were warming the market up for it. But when you look at the reaction from the press conference, in spite of the fact that Jay Powell was very adamant that it's critical that we bring inflation down to 2%, it's essential we bring it down, we're going to bring it down, uh, the market took the, uh, the, the, the announcement in the press conference as somewhat dovish, really, I thought. I mean, the dollar falling, I thought that was interesting. Uh, the two-year Treasury rallying, the yield curve steepening. That's not really a hawkish action by uh, the dollar or the bond market. So uh, Jay said a lot of things that were seemingly contradictory uh, because he was trying to attack things from many different angles. And he really, I think, learned his lesson from May where he uh, kind of spent some of his credibility by, by promising no 75 and then doing a 75 just mm. and deciding on it apparently just days before. So what I took from Jay's comments, really, is he's become a very short-termist, um, data-dependent. We're looking at everything all the time. But in a certain sense, Judge, they sort of did, in a weird side-door way, kind of raise, tell you that they're raising rates to 3%, kind of what I tweeted out last night. I mean, when you're talking about 3.4 by the end of the year, uh, you're going to be at 3 pretty fast. And we're talking about 175 basis points of rate increase to get there, you're talking about 350s and a 25, or else a 75 in there, and you know, maybe one less 50 or something. So by September, it looks like we're going to be at around, you know, that range will be 250 to 275. And I don't really know what the difference is between raising it to three now and raising it in two steps in September. The inflation rate is so high, and this idea that it's about to come down to uh, anything close to the 2% level is completely out of the cards if you look at the data mm -hmm. right now. Our model at Double Line is looking for an inflation rate to stay in the eight handle now for a couple more months, maybe even print a little higher based on the fact that commodity prices got even more elevated, particularly energy. And so by year end, we might get inflation down into the high sixes. But when you're talking about a goal of 2% and repeatedly committing to that as an essential goal, I think he said, to uh, even allow for a functioning economy. You need, you need that kind of price stability. We're, we're so far away, I just don't see how we're gonna uh, avoid uh, that 3% number happening basically by the September meeting or something very, very close to it. So uh, very much as expected because the Fed told you on Monday what they were gonna do. Yeah, for, for certain, and, there, and there's a lot in there, and I wanna get to a bunch of things that you said. I, I want to begin on the credibility uh, issue of what you just said. Uh, the Fed chair saying he doesn't see 75 basis point moves as quote unquote commonplace. He said 50 or 75 at the next meeting is appropriate. And I know that's what you were just alluding to in your comments. Powell himself talked about getting optionality out of that. And I do want your reaction as well to a conversation that I had right before we came on, Jeffrey, with David Tepper, uh, who, who contrasted Powell today, as you just just did, uh, when Powell said last time that 75 was was basically off the table. Tepper saying, "Quote: Last time was ridiculous. At least this time, it's in the realm of the possible." He left himself optionality. Now, the question will still remain as to whether it's right or wrong. But nonetheless, mm -hmm. he at least gave himself back what he seemingly took away, as you alluded to in May. Your reaction to to what Tepper says. Well, I, kind of, I agree with David. I think I think his, his comments make sense. I didn't see that interview. I was uh, I was getting. No, it was just a phone. 
It, it was just oh, a I, phone I, conversation that I had. I see. Well, one thing that's amazing about the, the credibility issue is the Fed is making these predictions for rates a year from now being at, what, 3.8 or something like that in May of next year, and that being the high point. And they've got all these inflation predictions for next year and the year after. I, the, what, where the credibility is really lacking is why are you bothering? with all of these predictions for one year and two years from now, when you have, when you've had a complete U-turn on some of the things you said six weeks ago and a complete U-turn on things you said, you know, six months ago. So I just don't take those uh, credible at all on those predictions. And as I said, the model of double line, we're looking for maybe even a 7% uh, inflation rate for the year 2022 as a whole. And one thing I'd like to talk about, I think it's really important, it's something that uh, uh, Larry Summers published last week, and I thought it was really interesting, and I think it got the market's attention, and I think it has something to do with the incredible repricing of the short end of the yield curve in three short days, pricing in 75 more basis points in hikes this year, uh, is what the yield curve did uh, from late last week into, into yesterday. And what Larry Summers did was really very, very clever. I've become something of a fan of Larry Summers because he was the one person who had the courage to say it's not transitory inflation, that is, you know, a year and a quarter ago. But he did something that was really clever. There's been a group of economists that have been railing against the economic statistics, particularly the CPI, for a long, long time. These people, they call it shadow finance statistics and stuff. And they kind of unfortunately relegate themselves to a lunatic fringe sort of corner of of macroeconomics, because they act like there's a conspiracy going on. If the government is lying about the inflation rate that's really much higher, and it's because the methodology has been changing and substitutions and hedonics, and nobody ever pays much attention to them, but they've been saying, in shadow economists, that the inflation rate is really understated by about four or five percentage points based upon what, what, what was reported, uh, the methodology that was used back, say, in 1980. So in other words, they, they point to all of these changes and say they're lying to you, and people don't really take them very seriously. But what Larry Summers did was reach the same conclusion in a much more simplistic and much more less controversial way. Instead of saying, let's compare today's inflation uh, and use the 1980 methodology, so we're comparing the number today to the number in 1980, he did the opposite, which I thought was really smart. He said, let's calculate the 1980 inflation rate, which was around 13.5%. Let's calculate that using today's methodology. So he, he gets away from in real time calling people conspir conspirators and, and lying to people because we're not talking about real time. We're just accepting today's number, 8.6%. So what Larry Summers did is he said, let's just use the same methodology today and recalculate 1980. So you're not accusing anybody of anything. And so what he did is he said, let's just take shelter. He made it really simple. So it was very elegant. Let's just take shelter. Shelter's a third of the CPI, and they're saying shelter is up 5.4%. Now, everybody knows that shelter is not up 5.4%. Rents over the last 12 months are up double digits. There's, there's real series that calculate this. They're up double digits, and of course, single family homes on a median basis are up 22%. So if you actually use home prices instead of this owner's equivalent rent, which is just a construct, Larry Summers said, the inflation rate in 1980 wasn't really 13.5. Using today's methodology, it was something like nine. And I think that opened people's eyes because it's a, it's a way of accepting the methodology changes without criticizing anybody. And so basically 8.6 today is, sounds a lot like nine. And so the inflation rate today, uh, using the same methodology, or the inflation rate in 1980 at nine, using today's methodology and we're at 8.6 today, it's the same inflation rate. And yet, we have interest rates that are below 2% on the Fed funds rate. It's, we're so high on the inflation rate relative to 1980, about the same number, and the rates are so low. And that's right. why I think it's really foolhardy to believe that this inflation rate is going to meet these Pollyannic predictions and go down to 2% in the next year and a half. And, and I think the Fed is going to have to raise rates in line with what the bond market says. As I've said to you repeatedly and to your audience repeatedly, the Fed follows the two-year. So one of the things that, that, that Jay Powell said that was really disingenuous is he said that forward guidance they've been giving has been helping to tighten financial conditions. It's exactly the opposite. It's the tightening financial conditions as evidenced by higher short-term interest rates by 275 basis points. 
uh, on the two-year Treasury. That's what's been leading the forward guidance. He's got cause and effect backwards. They're following the bond market. It's appropriate they do so. As many commentators have said uh, today, and I think accurately, it is nice to see that the Fed's predictions for year-end are finally mm -hmm. matching uh, what's going on with the two-year Treasury, but they have to execute on it. That's why I think it's, I, I just think that they should, I think they should paint or get off the ladder, basically, when it comes to meeting this goal of uh, that 3% type of interest rate, and they should get there now. Do, do, does, the, does the fact that they, by pulling their, you know, by raising their forward guidance, but by getting that more in equilibrium, if you want to use that word, with where the market has been, does that calm the bond, bond market down? going forward now, Jeffrey, because some of the moves in rates over the last few days alone have been just absolutely shocking. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure even jarring to someone like you who's seen a bond market or two. Yeah, I've seen a lot of bond markets. I was around in 94. I was around uh, in the 80s. So I've seen, seen, seen a lot of st stuff there. I, I think the bond market has obviously been calmed down, at least for now. Uh, because, you know, there, there's, there's less uncertainty, as we talked about six weeks ago. At least there's less uncertainty. Uh, about where we're going. But the Fed heading to 3.4%, my suspicion is that the two-year Treasury is going to start heading higher again because the inflation prints are not going to be pretty. The next two that are coming out uh, will probably be somewhat stable relative to today's level. But then we have base effects that have been somewhat helpful in making inflation plateau in, in the lower to mid eights. Some of those base effects, which means the number that's rolling off from a year ago, the numbers that are rolling off from late last summer, the next the next month is a high number that's, that's rolling off. So inflation probably won't uh, be uh, will probably be somewhat similar to where it is today on the headline CPI. But a couple months later, there's lower numbers that are rolling off, and we have a potential to see a nine percent inflation print on a year over year one one month print anyway, year over year somewhere between now and year end. And I just don't see wow. how we can live with with a two year. Uh, with stability and feeling good. Uh, also, bond market liquidity is, is deteriorating uh, with the Fed doing quantitative tightening and just in general, the bond market uh, investors be, being on buyer strike or even on, in, in uh, outflow mode across ETFs and, and mutual funds and banks not buying, they're making loans uh, now instead of like buying mortgage-backed securities and stuff like that that they did a lot of last year. So uh, the, the problem we have is, is a liquidity problem. And uh, it's interesting. I, I saw someone on CNBC yesterday saying that what the stock market needs is, is an increase in liquidity. Well, of course, what the stock market's getting is exactly 180 degrees, the opposite of an increase in liquidity. Liquidity is going down. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go down further. So this, this summer is, is going to see, I think, um, further rate rises uh, later, at least later in the summer on the short term interest rates. Well, the, the question is, you know, and, and Powell was asked about uh, how committed he is to getting inflation down, even if he's doing so at a, at a point where the economy is weakening and potentially weakening substantially. He says the Fed is, quote, strongly committed to doing what it takes and they have the tools to do it. The question is, if it starts to look more and more like we're heading into a recession and inflation remains as hot as you just suggested it will, do you believe that he'll have the fortitude to go forward and do what he says he will if that's the scenario? He's got to. I mean, he, he said things in so such uncertain terms. I even wrote it down here. We, we have to restore price stability. We really do. Getting 2% inflation is critical and essential. That's pretty direct messaging. And so if, if, if inflation doesn't get down below, I would say, 6 uh, on year-over-year -year basis in the next few months, he's going to have to, like I said, he's got to paint or get off the ladder and get these right hikes through if he wants the market to, uh, I guess, restore his credibility, which I think everybody uh, agrees is a little shaken these days. Mm. It, the, the other question is, is 4% going to be enough where, where they've, you know, raised their their expectations? Is, is that going to be enough to, to do the job? I mean, and Steve Leisman who, you know, last time asked the question of the conference. This time I thought he asked the question of the conference and he got the money answer. It's certainly in the range of plausible numbers, uh, said the Fed chair. We'll know when we get there. I would think it would. Again, alluding to the, the 2022 forecast of 3.4, the 2023 forecast of 3.8, and the question is to whether that's going to be enough to get the job done. 
Yeah, it's, it seems unlikely uh, that it's going to be enough to get the job done. If you're really committed to getting positive real interest rates, Jay Powell, again, I wrote it down. He said, he said, two, he, he said uh, something about we're going to get to uh, 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 positive real interest rates, and the neutral rate is very low these days. So what he's saying is to get to real interest rates, you've got to, to get to positive real interest rates, you've got to get uh, the inflation rate seriously, it's got to be below the neutral rate. And he says the neutral rate is low. So uh, I don't know how you're going to get there with inflation running at, at eight, eight and a half, maybe nine percent in the near term. I don't see how you're going to get there with only uh, a three, three point four, three point eight Fed funds rate. So I, I think that I, I think higher if he's serious. I mean, that's that's the big question. He, they can they can see what happens. They can go to three point five or four, or, or what they're predicting three point eight, and just wait and see what happens. But the rest of his messaging is full of flexibility, being nimble, being data dependent. So it, it looks like they're they're trying to get to a place, you know, a destination uh, in, well, in the next year or two. But they're, the, what they're but, looking at is almost day to day, and so they're oversteering, so, I think, constantly. But I mean, these are these are somewhat unprecedented times, wouldn't you admit? So what's wrong with being a little more flexible than one might otherwise be, whether it's day to day or, or week to week? I mean, you, Mish, the consumer confidence uh, survey was unsettling. Uh, I think you used the word unnerving uh, when describing that. And that helped paint the picture of why today happened. Obviously, the CPI read uh, was much hotter than people thought. They were caught by surprise yet again. Uh, don't you want a, a Fed chair at this point? who is flexible, who's willing to sure. make a change of policy based on what the story dictates? I'm completely in favor of that. And here's how I, I propose doing it. Put the Fed funds rate to 3% right now and then be flexible. And if the data really starts to soften, bring it back down. That's also flexibility. The flexibility we're doing now is hoping that something good happens, but kind of fearing that that good thing isn't going to happen. So messaging that we're going to, you know, uh, hope for the best, but plan for further increases. And that's called flexibility. I call it hope. Let's do this, Jeffrey. Let, let me squeeze in a quick break, if I might. And we'll come back. More of our conversation, uh, our exclusive conversation today with, today with Double Lines, Jeffrey Gunlock. We'll be right back. All right, we are back in overtime and with our CNBC exclusive today with Double Lines, Jeffrey Gunlock. By the way, it was quite eye-catching was, was the exact words that the Fed chair used when describing you, Mish. Uh, I just wanted to make sure I was 100 percent accurate for everybody, obviously. You know, he did also address the current economic situation, uh, Jeffrey, in which he said, quote, there's no sign of a broader slowdown. It, it does sort of speak to the fact of whether they can pull this off, which, look, he sounded he's still trying to project confidence that they can that, that they can pull this off. Um, it goes to the issue of whether they've waited too long and now they're going to do too much. Esther George today, she dissented. She wanted 50. But speak to that issue, uh, if you could, because I know you have huge doubts. You don't think it can happen. You don't think they can pull off a soft landing. No, I, and I, I, I kind of uh... I think it's eye catching, frankly, or ear catching, that everyone keeps talking about how wildly strong this economy is. I mean, GDP was negative in the first quarter, and its GDP now from the Atlanta Fed for the second quarter is now at zero, and it's been trending in a southward direction uh, for, for the, last, the last few months. So, where's the strong economy? I mean, I, retail sales aren't exactly strong. Personal consumption expenditures, they, they, they look strong because there's inflation in there. Um, you know, housing is, is, has become extremely less affordable. The uh, average monthly payment, the monthly payment on a median home, uh, if you just take the median home price and the, and the, and the 30 year commitment rate, that payment is up by 45% year to date. So it's pretty obvious that these uh, higher mortgage rates, which have doubled uh, in just the past several months, are, are going to cut into things. You mentioned the consumer sentiment. Uh, that's terrible. And I think it has a lot to do with the price of gasoline, the price of cars, and the price of housing. But it's still the number is the number. It's the lowest number ever uh, on consumers, consumer sentiment. And we all know that uh, a lot of consumption was pulled forward 
durables exploded to the upside two years ago and stayed elevated until very recently and are still way above trend that was in, in place for the years prior to the lockdowns. So you can't expect any growth at all. You should be expecting negative uh, trajectory on the nominal value of durable spending. Non-durables is also above trend. So what we got left is services, which was correctly pointed out by Jay Powell, that the inflation rate is, is very, very problematic in services, and it's probably going to get worse in the months ahead because there's so much pent-up demand for travel and leisure and hospitality. But all three of these things are either at or above trend. If we go back to 2016, we, we, we took a huge hit during the pandemic, but we've more than recovered by, by a lot in durables and non-durables and are almost back to trend in services. So where's the growth supposed to come from? It's not housing. Uh, you know, is, is, it, is it gonna come from global trade? Doesn't feel like it. So I, I just, I have a hard time finding where the economic growth is naturally going to come from. And while you're raising interest rates and, trying to, and promising multiple times that you're watching inflation, you know it hurts people, you care a lot about your duties to uh, you know, take care of the American economy. You know? And so you're going to be moving interest rates higher until the inflation rate comes down. So we really have, uh, Jay Powell admits it's one of the most difficult times, like everybody knows that, and uh, to say that we're going to avoid softness, I mean, we're already in a soft-ish soft landing. That's putting it kind of kindly. So if you think things are going to get worse, and by raising interest rates to fight inflation, your intention is to make things worse. I just don't think the, uh, the non-recession case has much of a probability. Mm -hmm. The other thing they, they obviously are going to try and avoid doing is breaking something, if you will, in quotes, um, in the bond market. They've got, you know, the role of the balance sheet, QT. They're staying at the current pace, the level of the runoff. That's what Powell said today. I did read an article a few hours ago that suggested central banks weren't going to be able to go at the pace that they plan to because credit spreads are, are going to widen, if not widening already, and that was going to force them to scale back QT. Do you agree with that? Uh, they'll only do that if the, there's very significant damage, either economically or to the stock market. Or the one thing that no one likes to talk about that seems to happen a lot when you have very, very uh, large volatility in risk assets is somebody blows up. And that usually starts to change the narrative. We've had such a huge decline in parts of the stock market and stock markets, many stock markets in the world. I mean, emerging market equity year to date is down 20, is down 15 uh, percent. Most equities are down uh, that number. Nasdaq's down 28. Bitcoin is down 53 percent year to date and 45 percent just since the last Fed meeting. Uh, we've already seen around the edges some blowups in parts of the crypto world, and that could be uh, foreshadowing some problem. And I also notice that some of the uh, financial institutions in Europe, their stocks are pretty weak. So when, once you put all this into a system that was living on very low interest rates and therefore very likely very leveraged up, I, I think we're, it's very uh, possible that we see some sort of a, of a blow up uh, that mm. happens. And that's, that's, that's the thing that is, is worrisome. Um, I also think that uh, you know, the, the, VIX, the VIX, never, in spite of the S&P going to a bear market, and there being a lot of bad numbers. I mean, if you look Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday at the stock market, I'm surprised the VIX didn't go higher. So I do think that uh, the, this uh, sort of a, a dovish read almost, I think, off of, off of the Fed's press conference. I mean, it sounds hawkish doing 75, but the dollar falling and the short end coming down this doesn't exactly take it as the hawkish, takes it more as, as dovish. I, I think that mood, we could see a replay of six weeks ago. Where you know we got, we got we got a relief rally. We've had that a number of times now uh, as the Fed has raised interest rates, and uh, I, I think we might see a reassessment on, on mm. just uh, how, how likely that soft-ish landing can be engineered by the Fed. I don't think it's possible. Let me get your view of a few uh, asset classes. I mean, you alluded to all of them here, but I want to drill down a little bit more, if I, if I may. Um, crypto, okay, twenty-one-five is where it is as Bitcoin is mm. as we have this conversation here. How low do you think it's going? Well, I, when it broke below 30, it looked uh, on a chart basis that 20 was like, oh, going to happen really quickly. And it did. 
But the, the, the trend in crypto is clearly not positive. I mean, it topped out a long time ago. I remember I was with you in July of last year, and Bitcoin was up at like uh, 60,000 or something. And, uh, you know, that, then, then the, it dropped down to 30,000. Luther was going to break down, but it managed to rally back. But it keeps putting in, uh, it, it looks like it's being liquidated. So I, I don't, I'm not bullish uh, at, at 20,000 or 21,000 on Bitcoin. I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if it went to 10,000. Wow. You, you've, speaking of falling, um, you have suggested to me and our, and our viewers in prior appearances that you did think the dollar was going to weaken. Now, I, I'm not sure if you think, I mean, it's, it's been really red hot and the dollar's been so strong of late. Um, let me ask you first, has, has the dollar... Uh, had more staying power uh, being as strong as it has for, for longer than you expected? Because I know you do think it's going to go weaker, but it's been really strong. Has that caught you by surprise? Not at all. If you listen to the replays of my webcast, I have all year and for the past 12 months have been bullish on the dollar in the mm -hmm. short term. I'm very bearish on the dollar long term. But I'm, I was bullish on the dollar near term. Uh, and, and now I think the bull case for the dollar is getting worse because the, uh, the uh, ECB is going to have to start tightening interest rates and other countries are going to start tightening interest rates. I think the Fed was kind of the pace car on hiking interest rates. And that was the reason I was bullish on the dollar, that the, the, the Fed was going to be uh, relatively raising interest rates more than other central banks. I don't think that's really likely the case anymore. You can really see the dollar strength has a lot to do with the dollar versus the yen because the BOJ is absolutely willing, it appears, to sacrifice the yen at the altar of zero interest rates. And if they're just not even really taking seriously uh, what's been going on with global inflation. And so the yen has just been mightily, mightily weak. Uh, the euro has been relatively weak, but not so much re recently. I do think that the dollar is going to fall very sharply in the next recession. My, my viewpoint is that the dollar has been strong. I've expected it to be strong. We've not been, uh, we've been in the dollar. We've not been short the dollar uh, this year. And I, I expect to be, to be short, to, to, to going into a recession be strong because of the Fed's raising interest rates will lead to the recession. But then once the recession comes, uh, I, I think the Fed will go to zero mm. pretty fast. Again. And so that, that wow. would be the, the minute that the dollar rolls over. Okay. Do, do you still like commodities as much as you have? I, I'm, I, I like commodities for the longer term. The, the move is just so convincing. It's, it's very overextended, but it doesn't correct. And so I think investors should have a structural position in commodities. You've danced around um, emerging markets for a while, I know. Uh, have you stayed on the dance floor? Have you done anything or have you bought them yet? No, you said I, you were taking a look. <laughs> I wish I had because they've started to perform a little bit better. But I'm really waiting for that dollar break to happen before I pull the trigger on emerging markets. They've stopped underperforming. They've stopped. They started outperforming. It's the U.S. that is now underperforming. The rest of the world's underperforming Europe. I've, I've liked Europe. I've been in Europe for over a year. It's been an outperformer versus the S&P 500. I have not pulled the trigger on emerging markets. But uh, when I do, I think I'll do it in a big way. I, I, I just... I just don't think it's timely yet, uh, although I am a little bit impressed by how it's been outperforming against uh, the developments of the past uh, few, few months, which has been obviously weakness for a lot of risk assets. Two more quickies for you. Um, stocks, U.S. stocks. What's your view well, on, on where they go from here? I mean, we, we, are you new, you're yeah, neutral I'm now? I'm kind of neutral on stocks right now. I mean, we got to the 35 on the VIX, which is a level at which I, I start to not really feel very negative. Uh, we're back a little bit lower today, understandably, but um, I, I think I think stocks are going to put in new lows. But I, I, I don't I, I don't think that this is a good time to sell them right now. I think what we've seen has been a pretty big decline, and so I, I think we will get a better place to, uh, to to sell them today. So I'm sort of neutral. I, I'm not a, aggressive aggressively advocating. But if you still if you wrote it all the way down this far, I, I do not think to the, today or certainly not yesterday is the moment to sell. And lastly, I'm going to go right into your wheelhouse. I want our viewers to hear from you. What's the, the most exciting or attractive part of credit to you right now? Well, there's a lot of opportunity, but you have to take a lot of risk. There's, there's a lot of things that yield 12%. They're, they're, they're risky, uh, but they're down the capital structure and structured products and the like. 
Um, also, weirdly, uh, in the last few, just in the last few days, um, maybe the last week, our models on where fair value is for the 10-year Treasury have gotten really, again, we'll use Jay's phrase, eye-catching. One of the things we use, there's, there's models that we use on, on the 10-year Treasury, and some of them actually have been saying that the 10-year Treasury was correctly priced as recently as a few weeks ago. But weirdly, a bunch of them have now said the 10-year Treasury yield, are you ready for this, is too high. That, that, that these are good signposts that have worked over time. Like the copper gold ratio says the 10 years too high in yield. Um, the GDP um, uh, blend with not, not all GDP with the German 10 year, which is a strange indicator, but it works very well, says the 10 years too high. It's kind of strange. I don't know if that's just a short term blip, but it kind of suggests that there's a counter trend rally coming at, at the long end of the Treasury market, which I've, I've been advocating for as a hedge. But if you haven't done it, and you're scared. You've been scared, and been right to be scared. I mean, I'm looking at my at my data again. I mean, the the 30-year Treasury yield uh, is up 35 basis points since the last Fed meeting. A little less uh, in the, since, since this was printed an hour ago. 10 years up 41 basis points. Year to date, 10 years up 189 basis points. Uh, so uh, you know, I, I think a counter trend rally in the bond market, which may have started today, and uh, the long end even started to start to uh, participate. In today's rally, first the, the two-year, ten-year, the two-year, thirty-year spread was flat last night, and was flat when Jay took the podium, and then widened to twenty basis points as he was talking. And I, what the market liked is there's no guarantee of supersized interest rate hikes baked into the cake, and that's when the stock market rallied, the two-year rally. But the long bonds sort of joined, and I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, the long bond go back down to three percent. So you might you might have a short-term trading opportunity there. Interesting. We will leave it there. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I like these regular appearances on Fed Day, and I know our viewers like to hear from you as well in, in your real-time reaction to it. We'll see you soon. All right. Thanks, Judge. Good luck out there. All right. Yep. You as well. That's Jeffrey Gunlock of Double Line joining us there in a CNBC exclusive.